Campus Religious Studies at the University College of the Fraser Valley, Ron Dart. <laughs> and another face you'll recognize from this wonderful film, Archbishop Lazar Pohalo of the Orthodox Church. And there are a couple of people in the audience tonight that we'd also like to recognize. Yeah, uh, we have our composer here, Marcus Zur. Where are you, Marcus? You want to stand up? I don't know if we can get some lights up here, that'd be great. Uh, the other person is Matt Bork, uh, of the band Yuka, and it's his song that uh, you heard on the, the closing credits. Matt, are you up there somewhere? Is he? Thanks. My name is Christopher Morrissey. I teach philosophy at Redeemer Pacific College at Trinity Western University, and I'll be your moderator for tonight. Yes, some people from my classes are here tonight. Well, I'd like to kick things off with uh, a quick response to the film. First thing is a practice Just so I can get it up here a little easier. So this is for you. Maybe this suggestion. We discover Christian teaching about purgatory. There you go. Maybe that can help us. And in the second comment, uh, just a quick quote from an encyclical letter called Saved by Hope, Space Solid, by Pope Benedict XVI. His Holiness writes, To protest against God in the name of justice is not helpful. A world without God is a world without hope. Only God can create justice. And faith gives us the certainty that he does so. The image of the Last Judgment is not primarily an image of terror, but an image of hope. So on that note, we'll be pleased to take your questions. If you'd like to identify anyone in particular uh, to whom your question is directed, please. I'm going to interject here a moment because I'm taking somewhat of exception to what's being called tradition. Uh, since I represent a church that existed before the gospel was put together, before the New Testament was formed, and the divine liturgy is older than the New Testament. In fact, the... Uh, both of us, what do you call exclamation at the end of the Lord's Prayer for thine unto kingdom, power, and glory does not occur in the scripture. It was uh, placed in there from the divine liturgy by one of the copyists, but it's not actually in the Bible. In the Lord's Prayer, it's deliver us from the evil one, not evil. But what, I, think, I want to say what I see as part of the problem. First of all, the uh, blood atonement doctrine did not exist before the year 1000, until after the year 1000. No one in the ancient church ever believed anything like that. That ransom and redemption tell us that we're being purchased from someone who has no legal right to us, that holds us illicitly in bondage. And Apostle Paul says exactly what it was we were redeemed from. Christ did not die to save us from God, as the doctrine of atonement teaches. It's just something borrowed from Molech and Baal. It's not the tradition of the church. Christ redeemed us from bondage to the power of death, to the fear of death, and therefore redeemed us from our bondage to the prince of this world who held the power of death. The other one did not exist anywhere in the church before the year 1000, and for us that's quite well. Secondly, the doctrine of original sin, which predicates part of this, which tells us we all personally inherit Adam's sin, and the guilt of Adam's sin, is not the tradition of the church. It's a Gnostic doctrine. It's from the Manichaeans, it's not from the scripture. And secondly, the idea that hell is a physical created place is not the tradition of Christianity. It's something that came to pass and really became solidified after the Black Plague and the barbarian in, in, invasions of the West. The Orthodox Church is not universalist, but hell is a psycho psychological condition that the conscience places us in when we come face to face with the glory and the love of God. That's the traditional Christian teaching. I just wanted to establish that before we start. <laughs> Very good. We'll take your questions. You can direct them to anyone in particular or to all. 
Yeah, should I just stand up? Or Don't be shy. I'll come right. to you. I can even bring the mic. You can shout it if you wish. I can probably be heard well enough. Um, I do a filmmaking question, but also for the, the panelists at the front. You made it through an entire film on uh, the Christian view of hell without a lot of exposure to the, the divisive metaphors in the gospel, the, the sword, the wheat and chaff, the sheep and goats. Um, was that a conscious choice on your part as a filmmaker? Was that the material that you received from your subjects? And how how does that play out into you know the the the, the three theologies of hell that you present as well um, as they are pervasive metaphors in the Gospels? Good question, Kevin. How did you decide what to include in the film? Yeah, that is a good question, and. This is the difficulty of trying to uh, address a topic like this, especially a theologically contentious topic like this in about 85 minutes, is um, that there are so many different images of judgment, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and a lot of them coming from the mouth of Jesus um, himself. And so, um, but one of the things, if you're trying to make a movie that's going to play in theaters like this, um, it's a fine line of how much detail you're going to get into. So I felt that what we could do in this film is at least address some of the broader issues. And um, a lot of these guys here and many people in the film have written books that go in depth on every one of these things. Brad Jersak's written an excellent book, which actually inspired me to make this film called Her Gates Will Never Be Shut. When, and in that book, he actually goes into each one of these different images of uh, judgment and all the various terms that are used that are, I think, more mistakenly translated as hell uh, throughout the history of biblical translation. Yep. Who's next? Question from Mitch. Hi there. Uh, this is, I guess, addressed to all. I know that um, some authentic spiritualities, such as uh, St. Catherine's thoughts on the face of uh, Christ at judgment, uh, she says that heaven would be like hell to the damned. And after reading one of Heraclitus' fragments, actually, this morning, um, that the path up and down is one and the same, has it, um, to any of your knowledge, has ever been postulated that heaven and hell, in a sense, be one and the same? Yeah, the, uh, the river of fire, uh, St. Abba Basil the Great tells us, the river of fire that flows from the feet of Christ the Ancient of Days in the book of Daniel, is both heaven and hell. Because to some it's received as warmth and light, and to others it's received as a burning fire. Uh, heaven and hell are the same place. But the love and... Uh, because God is everywhere present and kills all things, there's no place for God. By the way, there are no species of grace. Uh, there's only one kind of grace. Uh, I, I don't know where that came from, you know, the sprinkling on grace and the arm-twisting grace and the shove-you-around grace, whatever the stuff is. Uh, grace is the energy of God, and the word energy is used 26 times by Apostle Paul in the New Testament. How many of you have ever seen it there? Anyone else on the panel? Yeah. That's the <laughs> I appreciated the fact he used Catherine of Siena and Heraclitus. Um, very interesting. T.S. Eliot begins the four quartets with the, that very passage he used from uh, Heraclitus. And I think if you were to go through each of those uh, quartets, uh, you'd find a, a very illuminating answer to the question you're asking, without going into detail. That would, would uh, you know, have us walking through the four quartets, because in the four quartets, really, T.S. Eliot is summing up uh, the history of Western and Eastern spirituality and philosophy and the church, and he's pointing the way forward, and he's certainly exploring the relationship of heaven and hell. Uh, anyways, the same way William Blake is the marriage of heaven and hell, and so if you, you get your hands in those little missives, which are really compact uh, gold, you walk down that trail a little bit. Uh, sure. Uh, a good analogy for that is is what happened in the wilderness with uh, Pharaoh and his armies and the people of Israel. There was a uh, the presence of God to the to uh, the people of God who loved God was like warmth and comfort, and to those who were uh, hated God, it was darkness and storm. The very same presence, and so um, so then the question is, what what will the presence of God be like for us and for those? Um, for all three positions, and then uh, you can you, you, you can answer from that point of view of the one river of fire that flows from the throne. 
Uh, but you'll, there's lots of books about this. Although it sounds, if you're using Heraclitus for your devotions, you're hearing good stuff already. <laughs> <laughs> Just put up your hand. I'll come to you. I see a question at the back. Here comes the mic. I'm sorry. Yeah, my question is, um, as a result of making the film and all of the research that it exposed you to and the conversations that you had in all kinds of different theological circles represented by different denominational teachers, were you able to determine anything about how that uh, the doctrine of hell is um, impacting kind of what the um, universal church in North America is thinking or how it's changing or or what kind of impact is a subject like this uh, having on how the complexion of Christianity uh, is changing if it is changing and then in what way is it changing based on what you're able to project from this yeah well whoever on the panel wants to answer has to raise their hand and I can run the mic to you first what? No hands up? Yes, it's wrong. I think what has happened in the last 20 years, there's been a seismic shift in the way a lot of people coming out of the um, reform, evangelical, conservative evangelical tradition are, are thinking about the faith. And it's caused a counter-reaction in terms of the rise of neo-Calvinism again. And one is the, uh, just three points that you get in the Bible. One is the violence of God that you find in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy, Joshua, where God commands people, uh, the Jews in this case, to essentially uh, commit genocide. And so how can you have a loving father, God, on the on one hand, and uh, someone who uh, commands you in a theocratic way to commit, uh, commit genocide? The other is the penal theory of the atonement that's being called into question, because there's six views of the atonement in the Christian tradition, and then there's the heaven and hell one. And a lot of the postmodern church are really um, interrogating these traditional strongholds. In one sense, the Sanhedrin has held them for 500 years, and they're being questioned. And as a result of questioning it, you're, you're getting the leadership within that historic um, reformed and evangelical tradition are, are, are biting back very strenuously and very hard. And you've seen many of those people in this, in this particular film. And so a clash is emerging between those who are questioning some time-honored perspectives in terms of how you interpret the Bible and those who are reinforcing those traditions. And I think a bit of that was played out in the drama of this film itself. I'll just comment on that quick. I think, yeah, Ron has really, I think, described it accurately. And I think that um, what we're trying to do in the film here is is provide a tool that helps advance the discussion. Because I think that the equation in a lot of people's minds is question the dominant view. And that means you're trying to duck the authority of Scripture. You're somehow a heretic, I mean, is, is one of the words that, that um, people get called. And I think what we're trying to say is that impugning somebody's character just because they disagree with you is hardly a recipe for a fruitful discussion. And so we're trying to encourage people to move beyond that. Question right here, and then the gentleman at the back. Sean, could you pass this behind you? Yeah, um, I really, I have been trying to listen to everyone on this issue because, um, I grew up in a more Calvinist um, a background, and then I move into groups of um, other Christians who think of God maybe in a different way, and hell in a different way, um, and so I'm trying to see God, uh, hell as a state of consciousness, or, you know, the lock me on the inside, or however you want to say it. But then I look at the Gospels, and Jesus is calling demons out of people and sending them into pigs. And this is literal stories. Like, these are witness accounts of, like, that kind of thing. So if hell is just a state of consciousness and not a place where there are beings, then where are those demons coming from? Who wants to take this one? Yeah, I'm not sure I heard everything about it, but the idea that there has to be a geography of heaven and a geography of hell is probably uh, a kind of an idolatry created. But 
If Helen, you know, we don't believe in the destruction of the Earth and the universe, I'm, I have to say it from this point of view, but the transfiguration of the cosmos into the perfect will of God, where God is everywhere present and fills all things. And St. Abba Anthony the Great says it would be a great error to believe that God would love people in hell any less than he would love people in heaven. Uh, because God is only God. But the, the idea that heaven and hell are the same place, it very simply, uh, what the ancient church did teach because yeah. heaven would be hell for those who have re rejected the love and glory of God. And uh, then they're face to face with the love and glory of God that they can't escape from. There's no darkness in which to hide, even though it appears dark to them. So, the, the uh, I mean, I don't know if I heard your, your whole question correctly, but I, I want to say, you know, that faith is not coming into accord with the system of supposed facts. Faith is an orientation of the soul toward the will of God. Religion is a degeneration of faith into an ideology. But faith is an orientation of the soul toward the will of God. It's not coming into accord with one or another systems of facts. I think one of the dangers of, our, of reacting to certain elements of the Calvinist tradition, uh, which you certainly can find in the Bible, and you can certainly find in the tradition itself, is that it demonizes that because that position has been dominant and then the um, opposition to it becomes the idealized position. And I think from the film itself, in heaven and hell, even in the Bible, you can argue the uh, infernalist position, you can argue the annihilationist and the universalist. And you can find those uh, particular positions in the tradition itself, depending on where you dip your, your uh, bucket into it. And so we have to be careful this transition period when people are grappling with this is they don't demonize what's once dominated and idealized what has once been subverted. And it's that, that healthy ecclesial conversation that I think is the way forward. And that's the way of love. Well, we have 15 minutes left and six hands up. If you have a burning question, you better get in the queue. I'm running up to the back for a gentleman who had his hand up. Is he still there? Here he comes. Um, Thanks for the film. Um, I'm really going to stick my neck out on this one, so don't anybody throw stones. Up until now, the whole conversation about hell is about this is a place where people may or may not go, but we're also taught that Satan is there, his, his angels are there. In Colossians, it talks about that Jesus is reconciling all things, all things in heaven and on earth and under the earth and all things that were created. Do we hope beyond hope that hell in its entirety may ultimately be empty? Not only people, but do we hope beyond hope that the ultimate prodigal son story is played out where Lucifer comes with hat in hand and the father says welcome home so we're going to take this one does universalism include lucifer and the evil angels over to kevin stone that man <laughs> uh, you know it's interesting what you articulated is what Origen taught and actually got into some trouble for suggesting I would almost suggest the inverse is that if, if, if a hell of fiery torment exists I think that the first person to be there to minister to the soul's suffering will be Jesus and I think if there's any saints in heaven they'll be right behind him so I think actually hell will be full and heaven will be empty I, I have to tell two anecdotes. One thing, Archbishop the Great was asked, "Could I pray for Satan and his, re and his repentance?" And he told the monk, "Certainly, and you should. I don't think it'll work, but try it." <laughs> and, and the other one, the other one was in the uh, Solovki prison camp, where all of the higher-ranking clergy were put by the communists in, in, in Russia, and uh, he had a three-year life expectancy. And when Lenin died. The guards came in and said, I want everyone to stand in for a moment of silence because Comrade Lennon has died. And one Archimedes, a priest, remained lying on his pile of straw. And uh, Archbishop Hilarion Troitsky, the holy new martyr, turned to him and said, Brother, why didn't you stand? 
And he said, because Lennon is burning in hell already. And I actually to Phil Arium says, but my dear one, you see, Lennon might have repented with his last breath that he would be in the heavenly kingdom, but you, because you refuse to forgive, will be the one burning in hell. And we have a question from this lady in the center. Can someone help me pass the mic back, please? Hi. Um, so bottom line, is there any evidence in scripture anywhere, or uh, even in, in word or principle, that says what I believe about all this stuff determines whether or not I actually go there? No. <laughs> Who said no? Let your yes be yes and your no be no. No. <laughs> I, I uh, apologize for answering again. Uh, <laughs> but the, the, really the teaching of the ancient church is that it's our conscience that judges us. To say now to Cyril, Cyril of Jerusalem and his catechetical lecture says, don't think that God's going to sit behind a high desk going through books. When, you're, when you come face to face with the glory and the love of God, your own conscience will tell you whether you're to the left or to the right. Your own conscience is going to judge you. And judges you in this life already. You know, and makes you have a taste of hell or a taste of heaven in this life already. Far more important to have a healthy conscience than to have a healthy body. And you suffer much less from a, an unhealthy body than you do from an unhealthy conscience. I would just say, uh, following Peter Abelard, yes and no. Uh, we don't want to go one way or the other. What we think and what we do live together in a very delicate dance, and to uh, negate one and elevate the other is very problematic. Very good. There's a hand up over there. I thought I saw a hand down here earlier. But Brad Jurzak's son has a question. I hope he's going to embarrass his dad. <laughs> <laughs> so throughout the movie, there's been a lot of people who are very confident in their beliefs and very confident that their interpretation of the Bible is correct. And I'm wondering, out of you guys, what has given you faith in your interpretation and if, how sure are you of that? Excellent question. Which version of the Bible? <laughs> Back to Dad. It's my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So, um, uh, great question, Domo. Uh, um, what you'll notice, there's an underlying lying movement to the movie that Kevin's described to me, sort of a, a, a three acts. And the first act is about certitude or certainty. And, uh, and then the second act, as we go along, is more about ambiguity. In other words, it, uh, there's questions, and it's more subtle, and it's more complex than that. And then the third, the third movement of the movie is about the humility of hope. And so I, I love how you worded it. It's like, what gives you faith? That, that in, in, in what you believe about this. And that, that's precisely it. I would say on, the, on these matters, it, these are faith statements. And um, my role in the movie was to, uh, in, in part, to say uh, our confidence and our certainty has often been presumptuous and a presumption that Jesus doesn't allow. He doesn't, he doesn't let you say, uh, you know, Everyone's going to heaven, or no, or or some are going. He just doesn't. It, it's 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 uh, it's got to be a faith statement, and and uh, and and we have to live in hope. And I think uh, I think that's that's where we want to stay, living in the tension of hope, uh, as best we can tell, and, and as best we believe. Uh, beyond that, when we get too dogmatic, that's when we start persecuting others and demonizing others. Yeah. And and, uh, and Jesus said, "Well, by your fruit you will know them." And and the fruit he's looking for sounds like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and so on, including self-control. <laughs> so um, that, that's my answer. Five minutes and three questions. I'll get the gentleman in the blue shirt and the priest over there. But first, another student from Trinity. Hey, great movie. Uh, and and like I find this topic fascinating and worth looking into. Uh, however, and this might just be a young person's apathy, but I kind of resign myself to not care uh, one way or the other. Like, I don't find it uh, personally important uh, whether or not person A or person B, what they believe, 
after death because really, I, who are we to say we know? So I guess my, when you interviewed that filmmaker at the beginning, and he discussed uh, the, the secular view of consequence in this life, I'm just wondering uh, if you believe that um, that's something that we as the body should be more attuned to and more focused on, like praying for souls in circumstances here. Like this is this is here and now. Like how how do you uh, see that? I'm gonna give this one to Kevin since he interviewed Robert McKee. Right. Yeah. No, I think that's a great question, and I would I would echo your sentiments. I would say I'm pretty much agnostic about what happens after I die, except I'm pretty certain I'll probably decompose. And um, what you know, what happens after that? I mean, honestly, who knows? But um, I think that Jesus, um, the harshest words that come out of Jesus' mouth, say in the Book of Matthew, are directed toward the religious teachers of his day who are so focused on the afterlife that they're ignoring the needs around them. And I think that his engagement with them is always to redirect them toward the needs of the people that are suffering and that he, he demonstrates that over and over and over again. One area where it matters is what we believe about the afterlife often affects how we pe treat people now in this life. And so I, I would add that to it. But could it be argued then that, that a more abstract attitude towards the afterlife, if, if we don't care about that, then we're more bound to uh, care about people in the moment. Or we may be more apathetic in the moment. Oh, that's true. Okay. You guys can go out later. There's a gentleman with a blue shirt here. We got five minutes, two questions. Is there a third burning one? Let me know. Let me know. Thank you. Uh, my name is Glenn, and I just wanted to uh, commend you, Kevin, for making a phenomenal film. I just, it's really. And for me, it's, it's really been a life-changing moment coming to this film because I've been a Pharisee all my life. And I've been struggling with this tension that you're talking about. Um, do we, is God loving? Is God for me? And does God, I've asked nuns, I've asked priests, ministers, people, does God punish people? And this is just the question I want you, the panel or someone to answer I get a different answer from every person almost does God punish people yes or no and the way I'm kind of looking at it now is God may punish people temporarily but never eternally and would you just comment on that Philosophical question. I'm tempted to answer. I like natural theology. I like divine natures. Well, who wants to answer this one? I got the mic. Okay, St. Of Anthony the Great says that God is only love and never changes. Uh, that he, the uh, council in Egypt in the time of Abba Anthony condemned as a heresy those who take literally the anthropomorphizations of God in the Old Testament, the descriptions. And, uh, it, it, I mean, that was an early counsel of the church, that God only loves, and, and that what comes upon us is, from our own actions and works, God doesn't punish. Uh, chastisement, perhaps, but not punishment. What's the difference between those two words? Uh, chastisement tries to keep you from, you, you know, it's like when you have a child and he wants to go play in the middle of the freeway, and you, you uh, do something to keep him from doing it, that's, I suppose, chastisement. But if you went to play in the middle of the freeway and you, and you beat him up, then that would be punishment. Or hope that he got run over by a truck. Uh, that would be punishment. <laughs> Thank you. I would just quickly add, uh, I don't think we have to wonder about this. I think we can observe it, the way Jesus encounters, quote-unquote, sinners in the Bible. And I think that what we see is a demonstration of what Archbishop Lazar has been talking about. In the story of, say, Zacchaeus, is that his conscience is just merely encountering Christ, is that his conscience condemned him and he changed his life, and there was no need to punish. He, he, he knew what he needed to do after he encountered God. It's time for the lightning round. Just the quick questions and the quick answers. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Who had their hand up? I've said enough. It's a yes or no answer. Is Mark Driscoll on your panel in Seattle? I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> not, 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 at, not at this moment. <laughs> well, uh, I'd just like to say how nice it is to have a... Uh, see? Uh, I'm Anglican, though, by the way. 
Um, one thing we need to be very careful of in the Church of God is demonizing groups, demonizing one another, because we always do it. Um, if we are to be universalists, let's have a universal view of God's one holy Catholic and apostolic church uh, and pray for her. Um, one thing that I'd like to say that we do need to also remember about our blessed Lord that the scriptures teach us, uh, the early creeds also teach us in the creed that's come to be known as the Apostles' Creed and uh, the creed attributed to St. Athanasius, is that whatever hell is, and we will always speculate on that, our Lord Jesus Christ descended into it. And we need to remember that. Christ descended into hell and on the third day rose from the dead. A sermon instead of a question. <laughs> but it was a good one. A quick question right over here. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, um, I, I just wondered... Uh, where does the atonement of Christ fit into all this? If there is, a, I, I kind of feel that the atheist that we seem to be at first was right, um, because he said if you take away hell, you can take away God too. And um, I find this movie incredibly biased, and the panel, of course, is biased. But the thing is, is that if you don't have a foundation, we have heard a lot of wisdom from a lot of people, from a lot of humans. But if you don't have an anchor, if you don't have the mountain to stand on that never moves like the word of God and I said it's interpretation but the God's word says it's not open for human interpretation do we believe it the way it's written obviously we don't <laughs> because you know the, the question is yeah the atonement of Christ was strangely um, not there in very much because God says he can't look upon sin he also says he is angry with the sinner all day long where does all that fit into things Great question. Kevin, is your film biased? What about atonement? <laughs> I'll say that the film is about as unbiased as the people watching it. Yeah. Including the fellow who just commented. Um, and, you know, it's, you know, I think that he raises a really important question, though, is um, the story. And this goes back to Robert McKee at the beginning of the movie, which is why I approached him, which is. Um, Christianity is a narrative and I think that there's certain ways of telling the story of Christianity that demand eternal torment in hell there are other ways to look at this and, and I think he was saying that we're, we're um, resorting to interpretations instead of reading the word the way it is well here's the truth is that nobody reads the Bible the way it is we all read the Bible the way we are it's all interpretation the text is interpretation the English version you're reading is an interpretation there's just no other way around it. And so this is why we need to listen to each other because we all experience it differently. We all see things differently. So rather than trying to shut down different views, we need to listen. I'm going to keep two quick questions. Um, I'm somebody who wants to um, believe that everybody eventually is going to be saved, but I also want to believe uh, in a high view of Scripture. Um, what do we do with... Uh, a couple of passages, um, the rich man and Lazarus, and what do we do with uh, with Second Thessalonians, where it talks about um, being apart from the uh, from the face of Christ? Rich man and Lazarus, apart from the face of Christ. Go. Uh, rich man and Lazarus uh, is a parable uh, where Jesus is addressing uh, uh, the the mistaken idea of who's in and who's out, according to you know Jews in, Gentiles out. Uh, blessed people in, poor people out, and he t he he takes um, he takes the belief system of the day and he flips it, and he and he says you are going to be completely surprised by this. Um, whatever that place of, of chastisement was, where the rich man is, we know it's not hell because even the traditional view of hell doesn't begin until the final judgment. There is no lake of fire until the day of judgment, even for the careful infernalist. Uh, so the place where he, where he was, it's a it's an unpleasant place, a place of fire and chastisement. But but uh, we know it's a parable because he's able to talk to Abraham. He's able to you know try to negotiate. He, he wants a glass of water. He still wants the Lazarus to be his servant. Go talk to his brothers. It's, so so it's a it's definitely a story, but it's, and it's a story with a point. And so be careful. Be very careful about being presumptuous about who you think is in and who is out. And that's part of what we're going at in the movie. Awesome. Yeah, Pope Benedict in uh, Save by Hope talks about that as an intermediate state. 
Purgatory people. Purgatory. <laughs> the last question tonight is the gentleman in the purple shirt. So I, I, I did have the first question. I'm totally sneaking in here. Um, but <laughs> it's good story structure. I would first of all like to begin by thanking each of you individually, as I have been affected by your work even prior to coming here tonight as uh, a, a member of the 5 and 2 Ministries on Hammondsford. We brought it to Langley. I'm the Langley coordinator for the 5 and 2. So first of all, individually, personally, thank you for your work. I've been affected by it in that and many other ways. And the question is, and the question is <laughs> arising from that, as we are taught that this narrative of Christianity is one of personal relationships, of direct one-to-one -one interpersonal relationships. The question for me, if for the panelists, and I, go, and I suppose for myself, is okay, we've been given these ideas of hell. Yeah, but what are you going to do about it? But how then? Oh, you wanted to add something? No, I don't want to ask. I just want to say <laughs> that uh, God knows what's in your heart. So, think about that. You know? Perfect. We'll go to our last comments from everyone on the panel who wants to say something. And thank you for sticking around during the Q&A. It's going to be a good workout. <laughs> David, what can you say? Wow, I've said enough tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't written a book like these guys, but the, but the journey of making the film has been a real eye-opener for me. And, and you know, it, it's a it's a journey, and, and I think you know making this film has taken us two years to do it, and here it is. And you know, part of my job was to get you guys there and here, but but you know, the bigger journey is you know to, to to walk through this and to figure it out. And and can we figure it out? That's the question. I don't know. We got to live in the mystery. We got to live in the tension of it. I love. Thank you, Chris. You're being such a wonderful bunny rabbit. <laughs> We just uh, be wary at this point in history, and uh, others have mentioned it, that we don't polarize one position against another. I think the Bible and the, the church tradition has an amazing concert of voices, and the degree we're willing to listen and to love, we move forward as the people of God. Yeah, that's uh, being, being open to each other and trying to understand that some of the things we think are differences don't matter at all and have nothing whatsoever to do with our salvation. Uh, but, uh, you know, when you talk about believing the Bible literally, we still have to ask which version. Because the New Testament quotes only from the Septuagint, it never quotes from the Hebrew canon. And the quotations in the New Testament do not agree with the scripture in the Hebrew canon. They agree only with the Septuagint version. And that's why I asked a while ago, how many of you have seen the word energy in the New Testament? Because Paul uses it 26 times in the New Testament, and energy is what the grace of God is. It's the, it's the uncreated energy of God. There are no species of grace. So there you go. Uh, for me, this has been a journey since I was a kid. Uh, for 10 years, I believed and followed Jesus because I was scared to go to hell because God would torture me there forever in flames. And I believe that Jesus was saving me from God. And I've had a major paradigm shift around that, where I find that Paul says that, God, that Jesus is not being tortured to, uh, to appease the wrath of God. But rather, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting man's sins against them. And so suddenly I realized that uh, I didn't have to be afraid of God, that perfect love casts out fear. That in my evangelism, I don't have to scare anyone to God or to Jesus, but rather I issue the invitation of Jesus uh, who saves us from Satan, sin, and death. And, and the God of love who sent his son to issue that invitation, I believe was issuing that invitation through the movie too. So uh, uh, that's a bias I can buy into. Thank you. The question was, what do we do now? Well, I, I think that I, I tend, my tendency is to come at these sorts of things actually from an intellectual or philosophical approach, and um, I try to reason my way through this, which some people could see as a form of madness. Um, and, and, and I think that um, my 
revelation through the journey so far of working on this film is the role that emotion plays in my life and in the things I come to believe and what I come to value. And I think that we all tend to believe that we sort of reason our way into the positions that we're at. But I, I'm beginning to think that, that really all there is ultimately is emotion and that the emotion, I think, can be our friend, but I think it can also be our biggest enemy. It can be the thing that propels us to explore and to learn, but it can also be the thing that that um, can be terribly explosive and destructive. So I guess where, what do we do with this is I hope it just spurs us on to a greater sense of humility and love. And I, I think this is, for me, I have to watch this film over and over again, and this is always preaching that to me, to don't get so puffed up full of pride, because I think that's the tendency of someone with my disposition. What should we do? I just say, clothe yourself in the Beatitudes, and you won't go wrong. I think Christ said, if you love me, keep my commandments, but he only gave us four. And every one of them had to do with love and our relationship with other human beings. Mm -hmm. And uh, the two most powerful are to love God with all of your being, which is quite difficult to do. And the other is to have empathy for your neighbor. That's, what, that's the only way you can love your neighbor is yourself, is to have empathy. The meaning of evil is the total lack of empathy. That's what evil is, the total lack of empathy. And Christ called upon us time and time again to have empathy for others. That's it. The meaning of life is not hell. Far too many Christians have made the meaning of life hell <laughs> and the fear of hell. The meaning of life is love. There is no other meaning. There is no other purpose. Love is it. <laughs> if you think that all your questions have not been answered here tonight, you are correct. <laughs> the conversation continues. Enter into a classroom. You can get a degree in this stuff. It's fabulous. <laughs> May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Thanks for coming. Good night. <laughs>